All right, um, hi, so um, I'm Margaret Tucker. I am a member of GitHub's policy team. Um, and you might be asking, oh, why does GitHub have a public policy team? Um, and one of the reasons why we have that way, yeah. Uh, one of the reasons we have a public policy team is because developers are really important policy stakeholders and their interests aren't typically represented. Um, oftentimes open source is misunderstood, scapegoated, um, or just, you know, laws are written in ways that can break open source. Um, and obviously, you know, if the like many downstream dependencies of, of open source collaboration, um, making sure that people are able to collaborate and connect across, you know, different like borders, different, you know, countries, all of those things is very important. Um, so with this talk today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about how we do policy advocacy. Um, but the main thing I'll be doing is demoing our innovation graph, which um, is this website, it's really cool, and we'll get into it, that'll be the most of the talk. Um, and we made the innovation graph as a tool to be able to demonstrate the value of developers and code collaboration to policymakers and journalists. Um, and you guys can use it too if you want. Um, and then I'll get into just you know, some other options for how developers can get involved in policy. So, um, so we've seen all of, like, I, I would say that this, this year, 2024, is a really big year when it comes to tech because there's quite a few global elections. There's a lot of fervor around AI, a lot of fervor around cybersecurity, um, and also online safety. And open source intersects all of that. Um, so like we've seen a couple of different um, interesting develops. So the EU AI Act was recently passed. Um, that was the first major um, AI legislation that we've seen. Um, and it does relate to open source in some ways. And we, we did do a lot of work um, to try to keep open source um, out of it and focus on like large models. but. Um, that is a big one. Um, the U.S. executive order on AI came out last year. Um, that also has like kind of put for some things. Um, it's also called for some interesting things like um, you know data resources for openly available um, model weights. Um, on the cybersecurity end, the EU Cyber Resilience Act that was a big one. Um, so we we did a lot of advocacy efforts um, to try to keep open source more out of it. Are any of you familiar with the CRA? Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just give a, a brief on this one because it's gotten a lot of um, flack. So the um, EU Cyber Resilience Act was essentially kind of designed as like a um, consumer protection bill for products on the digital market. Um, and so basically saying if you're selling software that you, you know, should have certain cybersecurity things in check. Um, but there was some like kind of concern and I, I would just say that it was, it was challenging to get the wording right to keep open source out of that. Um, so obviously, you know, open source can be included in products that are sold, but if you're giving your software away for free, then you're not necessarily a vendor. Um, so that was another one where we were kind of explaining why they, you know, open source should be kind of kept out of these things or it should be considered in a way that doesn't break it. Um, oh, and then the U.S. National Cybersecurity Strategy is another one. Um, I, I would say with the cybersecurity strategy, they did like recognize the importance of getting the balance right of who has the you know responsibility when it comes to securing the software supply chain. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then on the online safety side, as I said, um, so this this election and a lot of people are saying this. We'll see how much it turns turns out to be true, but I think the specter of the 2016 election and how you know, Facebook played a role in that has given a lot of focus on deep fakes um, and also non-consensual intimate imagery. Um, there's been some really high profile cases. You might have heard there's a Taylor Swift one. There was a um, massive um, New Hampshire voter fraud scam using voice cloning. Um, so kind of this not knowing what's real and all of that has come up a lot. And then with that, there is more scrutiny on open source um, AI. And so that does come up on GitHub because you know, we are the, the largest code repository and some of that includes AI models. Um, yeah, and then there's also just quite a few different online safety acts. Um, and so anyway, a lot of in like policymaker interest in tech. Uh, but as you saw with you know, the, the challenges of this room being the government room and not necessarily having like the be best tech, um, a lot of policymakers don't understand open source. They also don't understand the value of open source. And so it, when explaining, hey, don't break this, this is important, this, you know, this software is you know, used in so many important things, um, you use it yourself as the government, um, it's, it's hard to kind of 
share the like, kind of global like, level of open source. Um, and so I guess that's kind of where the innovation graph comes in um, because, you know, we're GitHub and so we have a lot of data. Um, so obviously like the dependency graph and the Octoverse was the start of this. Um, but one of the kind of things that we've been moving towards as a policy team is supporting more research um, and generating more data to show like just what's happening on like the whole, you know, open source collaboration on GitHub. Um, and so with that, um, we started off with um, providing bespoke data to select researchers who were interested in seeing you know, top languages, collaboration across economies, things like that. Um, and as we were doing that more and more, we kind of built out this um, you know, process and built out the data so we could share it publicly um, with you know, privacy concerns and all of those things in Chag. Um, so um, yeah, anyway, I will get into the innovation graph. And we're just going to go on the website because the screen sharing um, worked out. Um, but, and if you want to go on it yourself, you're, you're welcome to. The link is there. Um, but basically, we had a lot of information um, about how people are interacting and working publicly on GitHub. So this is all public. It's not like enterprise. Um, but things like Git pushes, repositories, um, what economies are collaborating with each other, um, licenses, that one's a really cool one, um, different topics used by developers. Um, and so we built out this innovation graph website, and I already have it pulled out. So yeah, okay, so this is the GitHub innovation graph. Um, we launched this, I think, in September of 2023, so it's pretty new. I am particularly fond of this little graphic thing here, because you also can play with it which is fun. Um, and so we can kind of dive into it. As I, I showed you guys, these are the different metrics that you can use. Um, and then within those metrics, you can go on the data. Um, any of these sound interesting? Who, call one out. What, what do you, you want to see? Pushes, repositories, developers, economies. OK. So oh, the economy one is cool. Actually, maybe we'll do, yeah, economies. Um, so economies, like basically, we, we call it economies because there's you know some different like names for things, um, but um, and we use the the NAICS codes for for country codes. Um, but basically, every country of people who are using, including you know Antarctica, it's right here. We can see develop pushes on Antarctica. How many? How many we got? Oh yeah, not bad. 146 repositories. Um, Let's see, what else do we have? We don't have too much data on Antarctica. It's probably not a good example. Um, you know what? I'll just get into one of the more interesting examples we have. Um, this is one of my favorites. And we actually posted a blog about this. So if you want to read about this in more detail, um, check that out. Um, but one thing that we've been curious about and um, are kind of like, what, now that we have all this data out and people can download it, it's in a repository, like all the files are there. Um, we've been kind of curious about how global events have impacted collaboration on GitHub. Um, and so obviously things like war, internet blackouts, you know, like major global events, like how does that impact collaboration? Um, so well, this one's a kind of an interesting one. So we're on Ukraine. Uh, Git pushes, repositories, I'm trying to go down to the inbound collaboration metric. Licenses, topics. Ah, yes. Okay. So this is inbound collaborators over time. So this is people who are from another country. And obviously, VPNs kind of make this tricky, but we, we have a method to hopefully um, th like that they're, they're accurate. Um, there's a pretty sharp change right here. What do you guys think that is in um, Q1 of 2022? Anyone know what happened then? Oh, yeah, there was a war. So the war started. Um, and so this is actually pretty cool because it shows that there was kind of massive, um, like an influx of collaboration coming into Ukraine. And I think a lot of that, um, you know, it did like spike um, and it did cool down a bit, but it really stayed high consistently. And so, um, yeah, that, that was pretty cool. Also, huge shout out to Poland, because they, they've done a big chunk of that. Um, so that was a pretty cool one. And I think that we're, we're going to try to continue doing these like sort of insights of how things are happening on GitHub. But this one was really cool. Um, so I, one other thing that I will show you guys um, on the languages side. OK. 
It takes, I will say that the site is a bit slow. Um, yeah, all of this is public, and then all the data is, like we have all structured data files available for download. So you can go, this, our repository, here I can show you guys. This is our repo for it. Um, we have an engineer on the policy team, and he's really cool, and this is like kind of his baby. Um, and I worked a lot on the website development of it. Um, so yeah, so all the data's here. Um, do whatever you want with it. Um, we also encourage people who do use their data for research to let us know, send us the, um, you know, whatever you publish, because we also have kind of a, you know, like a hall of fame of sharing out what people have found. Um, so this one, it's a little bit hard to see up here, um, but this is the um, top languages globally. And some interesting things happened within the past quarter. One of them is, where is this? I'm looking for MIT CRO. Rust. Rust, this, the Rust story is crazy. That's pretty sick, right? Um, also, you can see JavaScript over, or TypeScript overtaking. Um, so TypeScript moved up to number four on GitHub. Um, I'm looking for Mulan, though, because that one just appeared within the past. Hmm. Hold on. Let me make sure I'm talking about the right thing. Q3 2023. Hmm. I hope I'm not promising something that's not correct. Huh. Wait, oh, I might be on Ukraine total. I'll just go on the. So let's go back to languages, all economies. If this doesn't work, then I'll just move on. But I, I thought this was correct. Huh, okay. Well, we did find this, and I don't know if it's on a different part of the site, um, but essentially Mulan um, uh, like premiered in like the top um, like languages globally in the past quarter, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, and also the MIT Zero license um, appeared in the top. Um, and I'm not seeing that here, but it, you gotta believe me, it is here. I think I just might have like the wrong um, parameter set up on this one. But anyway, um, so there's some really interesting things. I think the languages one is pretty cool. Uh, we played a lot with um, different visualizations of the data. Um, but the thing we're really trying to push for with here is making it as self-service as possible. So um, journalists or, you know, maybe a, a staffer on a, for a congressional team, um, anything like that, that people can just go and find out what they want to find out. Um, you can also cross compare. Um, and that, that's pretty cool to see how um, countries have moved um, through time. The topics one is pretty cool as well. I'll show you that one. Let's see, config. It's like the topics that are used on GitHub. So like there's a topics like selection on GitHub. Um, and this is the thing too, is like we're trying to find out like more of what people are doing on the platform, but it's kind of hard because it's like labeling's used inconsistently, like finding out what people are doing on, you know, related to certain topics or certain fields. Like it's just, you know, finding that is not as, you know, as intuitive as we would like. Um, and I really do love these, like, things are very interesting. It's like, oh yeah, Rust, Next.js, that was a pretty meteoric rise. Um, AWS, yeah. Um, so anyway, um, it's pretty cool. And I'll point you to the Insight Reports as well. Um, so this is where we share um, different um, research things. So it includes both stuff like on um, GitHub itself, like the Octoverse, but then also um, different AI indexes and um, different things on the benefits of open source. Um, so yeah, I, I think like the, the thing we're trying to get at with that is kind of moving towards a, an understanding and an assumption that open source is valuable and then actually having the numbers to back it up. Um, we're hoping to get more down to the state and maybe even local level, and so that's something we're pursuing. Um, and we do have a repository where you can open issues. People have opened issues to tell us like issues with the website itself and also share ideas and um, share their own research. Um, so please like check it out. Um, we're pretty passionate about it, and um, yeah, I think it's something that it's obviously it's 
public activity on GitHub, but it also does speak to just how you know collaboration is working broadly. All right, so now that we've seen our lovely innovation graph, um, here's a question for you: How can developers get involved in public policy? Well, you know, you can go to the GitHub Innovation Graph and find a bunch of information and share that with policymakers or write an article. Um, but you also can work with the public sector. So there's a lot of opportunities to directly work with the public sector. Um, and I would say that like an understanding of technology and especially open source is in hot demand. Um, so um, for example, Audrey Tang uh, is an open source developer and Taiwan's Minister of Digital Affairs. Um, there are quite a few opportunities such as like the Tech Congress um, and US Digital Service where they specifically look for people with that kind of experience. Um, but yeah, it's something that we really encourage and ultimately, you know, like in Europe, they fully have a pirate party. There's, you know, developers who are in parliament and we want to see the same thing in the US. We want to see developers not just, you know, being able to have their voices heard, but being in positions of power. Um, and honestly, this thing, it's only going to become more significant. So just never think that you're not a stakeholder in public policy because you definitely are. And with so many things being related to tech, it's really important to make sure that they don't break open source, are supportive of development. Um, and honestly, I, I, I will say this, um, we're definitely in a time of increasing nationalism. So being able to speak to the value of international code collaboration is really important as well. Um, also, so one thing that we're like really passionate about at GitHub is um, directly explaining how policy developments would impact you. Um, so there's a couple opportunities. These ones are active right now. So if you're interested and want to look into it, um, so currently the DMCA triennial review is um, like allowing replies. There were some really interesting submissions here. Um, so. There was one sponsored by the Authors Alliance and Library Copyright Alliance on um, AI and TDM for literary works and motion pictures. Um, and so they're looking to expand um, that exemption. Um, the security research exemption was just renewed. So we've done a lot of activism on, on that in the past, but um, that one is just, it was like basically renewed with no opposition, which is great. Um, so yeah, so definitely encourage you to check out the DMCA. Um, that's a big thing on GitHub. Um, obviously, we really emphasize the importance of dual use on our platform and understanding that um, you know things that like you know a project that may be used for security research has value and should be on the platform, even if it can also be used for malware. Um, so we kind of try to like distinguish um, with those things. Um, and then there's another one. I think the re um, the request for or um, input ends on the 27th of March, um, but the NTIA is having a um, dual use foundation artificial intelligence models with widely available model weights. Um, there's a lot of discussion about openly available both um, model weights, training data for AI, and it's a really interesting topic of conversation. I think that open source AI is, um, you know, it's kind of a a source of fear for policymakers, but I th so it's really important to articulate the importance of it, um, and also why, you know, having open source versions of these massive models or you know approaching things in different ways would be beneficial to society as we navigate this brave new world. All right, and then also um, I think you're all doing this already by being at a scale conference, but we really encourage people to participate in eco ecosystem stewardship. Um, so if you have opinions about how you know, open source policy, policy should be and how, what we should be advocating for, um, there are these groups already in existence, like the Linux Foundation, um, within that like OpenSSF is a, a big part of our advocacy on the security side, um, Creative Commons, Wikimedia, Open Forum Europe, Europe um, the Open Source Initiative, OSI. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can get involved directly um, where, you know, there, there are coalitions already. So if you, you're like, oh, how do I get involved? There are ways if you have you know, opinions about policy, if you want to contribute. Um, and depending on you know, what organization you're working at or what you know, projects you're working on, um, that might already be happening at your company or um, your school. Um, so with that, we also encourage people to be policy champions at their own organizations. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know where you all work, whatever, um, but, you know, you can, you can share policy priorities with feedback and feedback, even if you're not 
in legal or in policy, like everyone's a stakeholder. And I'll just say, I do a lot of, um, I've done quite a few submissions um, to you know, request for proposals on really complex like security policy topics. And I really am sitting down with a lot of engineers, hearing what they're saying, and then kind of translating that into you know, policy speak um, to kind of advocate for what we want. Um, also, you know, encourage open source of your organization um, and offer your skills for public good. There's a lot of opportunities um, to do that. We do have a social impact website, so there's some things that are specifically for skills-based volunteering with developers. Um, so yeah, I, this is, I guess it's kind of a speedy presentation. Um, here's some options for how to get in touch with us. Um, you can, so obviously if you want to comment on the innovation graph, you can comment on the repo there. We also have a developer policy repo that's more general. Um, we have a Twitter um, and we have, oop, we have a blog um, and I will say, I, 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 I run the Twitter, so if you want to at us, like we, we read everything for better or worse, um, so it is, it's out there. Um, oh, I guess it's not Twitter anymore, it's X. We, we can move on. Uh, and then um, also just, you know, share how policy impacts you, um, advance, oops, advance causes that matter to you, um, volunteer, encourage others to join you. Like, I think that open source is a really cool thing, and I think that it's definitely a value of, to any organization, and there's, you know, so many different ways to contribute. Um, yeah. So I'll open this up to q and I, I did kind of speed through that. Um, so if you have questions about other policy developments or the innovation graph or anything about how we do policy adv advocacy at GitHub, um, I'm all yours. And thank you all for, for sitting down for this. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, thanks for your talk. I work in climate change, so policy is also very important for us. Uh, but there's a, very often a misalignment in incentives. Like as scientists, we say, you know, we should be doing this, and policymakers are, oh, this costs money, we don't want to do it. So is there something that we can learn from you to be more effective, you know, in advocating for what we should be doing and maybe trying to align incentives between you know, what scientists say and what policymakers want to accomplish? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, I'll just say, if you're working in climate change, share your data on GitHub. <laughs> but um, no, I definitely think on like the policy advocacy side, there's a couple of different approaches that we've seen work. And one of them obviously is like make that constituent case. And that's what we were kind of trying to get at with the innovation graph is being able to get down to what's happening within your own country. And hopefully we can get down to counties and states and other kind of um, uh, geographies. Um, but I think like making that case, um, on like the side of open source, the economic um, argument is a very strong one. And so explaining the value to the economy. And then frankly, if you're within the US or other places, but especially the US, making a national security argument is another very effective thing. Um, so explaining, you know, I think there's a lot of concern about open source, but it's also important for, you know, the there's a lot of benefit to global collaboration that actually is counter authoritarian. And so it's something that um, can be supported. Um, I didn't include that this in um, this presentation. It was something that happened last year, but um, I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with OFAC licenses. Um, so anyway, um, OFAC is the Office of Foreign Assets and Control. Um, and so they are like the ones that work on sanctions. And so, um, there's, you know, obviously like there's different countries where you're not able to operate business. Um, and so we pursued, um, there's, there's been a couple, the main one was Iran. Uh, we pursued um, avenues to have limited licenses or um, allow people to use GitHub. Um, so that was a big one. Um, and it was actually kind of interesting because um, last year, I guess, um, I think it was in like the September or so, um, they extended those licenses, the things that we had worked out for years for other companies. Um, and so it was something that GitHub had done all this effort to um, you know, make our services available. And then the United States recognized that having these platforms available within Iran is beneficial, both to their security interests, but also to, you know, just pro-democracy things in general. Um, so I think that those kinds of arguments of thinking about what their their goals are and how whatever you're doing like fits within those is a big one. But honestly, I commend you on you know 
anything related to climate change. I, I did actually, I, um, I got into this type of work because I, I studied um, geography and I was really into open source mapping. Um, and it was a lot of stuff on climate change and sea level rise. And I got out of it because it was really depressing. Um, and so I, I definitely commend your work. Um, do you have any other questions? I mean, I can just say everything we do is on GitHub. GitHub powers our, you know, everything <laughs> that we do, so thanks for that. Um, I think one of our challenges is, uh, you know, if we want to see the economic benefit of our, you know, work in climate change, we have to wait like 50 years. Yeah. But, you know, 50 years is not the time scale a politician is typically interested in uh, thinking of. Yeah. So, you know, there is, a, you know, trillions of, uh, of dollars in climate change, uh, but there are, like, far in the future. So it's a little hard for us to make you know, compelling economic uh, arguments. Yeah. And national security. I'm not entirely sure what we can say about that. But well, I'll tell you, one project I worked at uh, was on um, sea level rise and defense insulation. So that's a big one. Um, so it's just like things will be, you know, there's a lot of money placed on our coasts and, you know, in vulnerable areas. So I, I think there's some arguments. No, um, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Are there any other questions, comments? Um, there's someone behind you. Oh, yeah. uh, do you have a, maybe a sort of quick list for how you would recommend people talk to policymakers to explain how something like open source is important, sort of a hit list for, so you're going to talk to a policymaker, here's, you know, here's what you need to, mm -hmm. to have in your, your presentation or your document for giving to them. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Like, obviously, there's, there are venues, like, on, like, the federal side where you, they, they have calls for proposals and anyone can submit. And so there are kind of de developer groups like DEF CON and other ones that have, you know, done these submissions. Um, and like, again, like OpenSSF is a big one with that. Um, so there are those kind of um, calls for proposals. With directly interacting with policymakers, like, Obviously, like the, the way we do it is like when we're kind of negotiating on legislation. Uh, but I imagine that um, for developers specifically trying to advocate, you, you have to have like a, an ask or you know something that you're going for. Um, I definitely like obviously there's you know things on supporting OSPOs, supporting um, just in general um, education, STEM education, things like that that I, I could see being like a direct ask. Um, but I I would say you know like trying to make the case for, you know, for example, the EU copyright directive. Are any of you familiar with that one? That one was a big one. Um, that was in 2019. It was before I joined the team, but I've, I've heard tale of it. Um, and so the copyright directive um, originally had a um, proposal, and we, we got it out of there, but um, a proposal to have um, software um, scanned. So with um, scanning, you know, using technical measures to detect copyright infringement, there was the proposal of like, oh, well, software can be copyrighted. Why don't we do that? But obviously, that doesn't make sense because you know, there's a lot of you know, um, independent duplication with software. There's you know, only so many th ways to get to a certain answer. Um, there's a lot of you know, conflicts with open source and how you know, software is developed. And so that was a big one. Um, and we actually did like mobilize developers and ask them to get in touch with us. And then we kind of like routed that to policymakers. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of different venues. And I don't want to say, oh, don't directly at your congressperson or whatever. But I do think that working through these venues of comment or working through you know different like civil society organizations that have developer interests, those are like you know those are people who have that like that's their job 24/7, um, and so I would definitely recommend that. Um, like for example, almost every um, CISA, which is the oh my gosh, Center? No, it's Information Security Administration. Uh, I don't know what the C is, but anyway, the, the main like kind of software security um, organization within the U.S. They do requests for proposals all the time, and you know who's always submitting them? Open SSF. And you know if you want to get involved, like that is that is a venue. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? That's a great answer. Thank oh, you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and again, like I, I would say on like the innovation graph side, if you want to say, hey, why don't we not block? You know, for example, like there are some considerations of blocking international collaboration like nationalism oh we're we're in competition with china for example so we don't want them to collaborate and you can make the argument for why it's important for chinese developers and american developers to be able to collaborate um, so anyway i guess i use the innovation graph and other other venues uh, for sure any other questions Yay.
Yay. How big is your team? That was the question. Oh, man. So our team is, is pretty small. Um, don't, I'm like, I don't know if I can share this, but we're actually getting a new member on Tuesday of, of for next week. Um, are any of you familiar with Felix Retta? Felix Retta? Okay, well, Felix Retta is a former MEP from the like, Parliament, um, and so he was a member of the Pi Pirate Party, was really involved in the Copyright Directive, um, so I'm very excited. That's actually... I'm like, don't, don't, don't tweet about it yet, because we're going to be announcing it on Tuesday. So um, we have Mike Linksfair. Um, Mike comes over from Creative Commons, um, and he's a really cool guy. I would definitely recommend like, just looking into He does a lot of kind of like thought leadership in general. Um, and then uh, we have a staff engineer um, who was a big part of building the, the website. Um, and he does a lot of things, um, are, not to take more time, but um, are any of you familiar with YouTube DL? YouTube DL? Okay, hey, all right, so um, you definitely, I would encourage you to look into it. So YouTube DL was kind of a, a big hullabaloo um, because we, we took down a, a popular project based off of a DMCA request, um, and it was taken down a bit hastily, and after we reviewed it, we realized that there were ways that we could have kept it up that wouldn't have been violation of DMCA. And so um, with that, we um, changed our processes, and we brought on a staff engineer um, and so now all of our DMCA requests are reviewed both by lawyers and engineers. Um, so yeah, we changed our, our process with that. Um, DMCA is tricky because um, there are, again, when we get into dual use, um, there, and YouTube DL was interesting too because it was like the, the YouTube rolling cipher and sharing a method for downloading YouTube videos, like that's not an extremely controversial thing. Um, and one of the, the main points of contention within YouTube DL was that there was um, copyrighted content in the examples they had posted on the repository. Um, and so kind of working with, hey, this is how we can keep this up um, is something that we do try to do um, with people. And the same goes for, um, for malware. Like we have a you know, very, you know, a, a supportive approach to dual use when it comes to security research, um, but we disallow um, malware on our platform that's actually being used for active attack. Like there's a difference between sharing this so security researchers can study it and then just someone who's perp like perpetrating an attack. So there's a lot of like, I would say like gray areas. Um, anyway, I'm sorry, that was a bit of a tangent, but it's, it's interesting. Um, all right. I will, um, yeah, I'll say thank you. And um, yeah, please like get in touch with our policy team. Um, oh yeah, so Mike, uh, myself, incoming Felix, engineer, and then one other policy manager. Um, so we're pretty small, honestly. Um, so I was wondering how close are you guys with Apache? Um, I think that like, like I would say Mike because he comes from like a very like he's a developer and he, he comes from that perspective like he does do more like like the languages side um, but most of like our interaction with like the broader developer ecosystem is through like the Linux foundation OSI and things like that kind of like feed in. Um, we also work with like Red Hat um, they have a policy team. Um, I haven't interacted with someone I don't know if Apache like if they have policy team um, and some of these like you know, when it comes to like package repositories, like there, some of them are, you know, very minimally maintained. And so that is something as well as like, you know, keeping, keeping things up. Um, anyway, all right, no more questions? Last chance? All right, thank you all. <laughs>